Everyone, please welcome Dr. Dan Sanderson. Again, uh, I want to encourage if there is any uh, questions about any of this or it would be uh, uh, for the benefit to you to contact me directly by all means, uh, just be grabbed by via email and uh, uh, certainly we uh, can expand into this. Today we want to uh, be able to address what tends to be one of those things that we uh, chatted about early on, the idea that if we have, uh, if we are actual treatment providers and uh, we are essentially engaging with our parents and uh, with the adolescents that we are treating, one of the responsibilities that we have, particularly with parents, is to be able to say, well, first of all, uh, I understand the nature of the condition that requires treatment. And uh, we have already reviewed that to some degree and uh, we realized, look, we're talking about a developmental vacation here. That this is a transdiagnostic orientation. Now, obviously, a child has all of these symptoms. Obviously, in the past, they um, uh, have had those great written diagnoses that have been assigned to them. But over and above that, we understand that we are actually treating a developmental vacation that uh, the child is refusing to grow up, so to speak, and they are avoiding the aspects of their life that would actually help them develop the wisdom, knowledge, competencies, and coping mechanisms that would be necessary for uh, uh, them to be prepared to be individually responsible young adults. Now, the second part about this is, is that we also have that obligation to be able to say, gee, if we know indeed what the condition is, then we also know the nature of the treatment that is required to alleviate this condition and, and uh, to be able to um, outline the application of this treatment as well for those parents that, uh, with whom we are working, families with whom we are working. And that the third part of this also would be how can I, as a treatment provider, give to you, the parent, a mechanism for assessing whether or not the treatment application is having its intended effect? Uh, yeah, I, and I, I, my experience over the years has been that there are been parents that have been somewhat jaded by this process um, in that uh, they have more or less uh, said, well, here's my child and uh, I'm just going to hang out here in the periphery to some degree and hang around and wait until whatever the magic that you are applying uh, does its job and then I expect you to, to present my child back to me in a, uh, a treated condition. And uh, I, I think what we want to do today is emphasize the kinds of things that are necessary so that the parent continues to have a position of, uh, of authority within the, the relationship and within the treatment process. And so that the parents have a mechanism of understanding how they can use the relationship that they have with their child as an assessment tool to determine whether or not the treatment is actually having its intended effect. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to address today. The other part about this is, is that we're going to also address the notion of manipulation because that tends to be the primary impediment in helping parents understand their aspect, their, their function in disrupting this developmental vacation. And once they understand really the basis and the core concepts associated with manipulation, then they tend to find themselves in a very empowered position uh, relating to their ability to be disrupting that developmental vacation. So let's see if we can move along here. I think I'm going to have to go back and start this to the place I think when we adjusted the, the sound. Okay. To uh, begin with, I think we're, we're going to actually talk about two different models of relationships. And uh, these are, again, these are independent of treatment. They tend to emerge 
and uh, they will help us understand the relationships that we have in our lives. They will essentially apply to not just our family relationships, but pretty much every relationship that we encounter. And we'll talk about this uh, somewhat amorphous blob that's kind of an odd looking shape there, but I think the, uh, the, the point of this is to realize that when we emerge into this world, when we are actually born and we come into this world, at that point we have no capacity to, to conceptualize ourselves separately from whatever our immediate surroundings might be. So there is no sense of separateness. There is uh, just an extension of everything that's out there, or everything that's out there is merely an extension of me as well. So now I, I have this me do kind of sense of, of uh, myself and of you. And uh, I really have no way of separating myself from all of this. Now, now, there's a lot that we can do to talk about this because the, this has much to do with the developmental tasks of childhood. Uh, we did address this uh, in our previous discussion, so if you want to hear my thoughts about that, um, you can go back and review the material that, we've, uh, that we have previously presented on this. But in any, <laughs> at any rate, part of that successful developmental process, then, uh, by the time that we get to be in our late adolescence, we want to have a sense of ourselves that would be different from that kind of enmeshed me you process. It would look something more, um, something more like this, where uh, I have achieved this sense of myself in which I have an identity that is separate from yours. And I have successfully been able to go through that um, individuation, separation process. That process tends to start at about age six, and uh, there are some distinct steps that we work through. Um, each one of those steps presents uh, uh, a problem for resolution as well. But uh, you know, ideally, we want to be working through that to the point where we have uh, a distinct notion of our identity and not necessarily just an image that is different from those around us. And more importantly, that we also have that sense of, of uh, responsibility for our own well-being, right? That, that notion that I can be okay independently and that I don't necessarily need you or any other kind of an external influence necessarily to make sure that I am okay. <clears throat> now, obviously, this is um, a fairly complex process, you know, particularly um, if you're working with children and adolescents, you recognize, gee, there is a lot that can actually go wrong with this process. And one of those things, that is, is that if our, our adolescent is still on that developmental vacation, they tend to remain very firmly locked into that enmeshed kind of a relationship where instead of having that sense of themselves, that, that notion of self-efficacy, they continue to insist that there will be some external influence, typically another human being, typically societal influences. Um, this may also be other kinds of dependencies that they use that there will be an external influence that will ultimately take responsibility for their sense of being okay. And uh, uh, that would be the piece that we would want to be treating. We would want to be able to disrupt that process because ideally we would like our adolescents to be in a place by late adolescence where they have at least a rudimentary sense of an identity as opposed to an over-reliance and a dependency upon an image. An image typically would be the thing that is facilitating their capacity to gather together all of these external dependencies that they have to give them a sense of being okay. Now, again, one of the things that uh, we'll try and uh, talk about in a little more detail, because we, we have talked about this process from childhood previously, but 
let's, let's talk about this other piece that goes along with emotional maturity. And it's very closely linked to the development of, of this, uh, this sense of identity that we're talking about here. And uh, we, we, can, uh, we can link this closely to the, nature, the, the idea of a value system and those kinds of things. But there is this other piece that's a little harder to measure, but it's just as important. So let's, uh, let's talk about this part here. As we are developing the sense of identity, it requires that uh, we accomplish two specific tasks. And it requires that uh, there is a degree of acceptance that we bring into our lives of the reality that exists as a part of who we are. The first of those is not really all that difficult because all that requires that we do is that we acknowledge and accept all of those things about ourselves that we consider to be our strengths, um, our talents, our assets, those, those kinds of things that we typically like about ourselves. This tends to be that public persona that we put on and parade around for the rest of the world to see. That's usually not a very difficult thing for us to do. Now we do it every day. And it's like, here I am, this is me, check it out, how you like that. This is, this is who I am, the public persona. But the second part, that tends to be a little more difficult. And that is coming to an honest and genuine acceptance of all of those components of our life that we would view as being damaged or defective or undesirable to, uh, to some degree. All of those pieces of us that we may consider to be broken, the, uh, the kinds of things with which there is a fairly significant and a painful emotion attached to this, right? And you know the kinds of things that we're talking about can be a myriad of, of events and experiences. Uh, some of this may be elements of who we are over which we've had zero control. <laughs> it, it could be more closely linked to biology, genetics. This is how I came into the planet. This is the body. Uh, somatic material that I bring into this. This is the brain and the neural material that I bring into this. Um, you know, some of those early childhood experiences, again, we had zero control over that. Uh, we had uh, uh, zero control over how we conceptualized much of that when we were very, very young as well. And, uh, you know, as, as we continue the law, and there would have been a number of those experiences that would have been painful for us that uh, to some degree continued to tell us over and over and over that there is something wrong with us. And uh, then as we continue, of course, there will be those kinds of things that we do as a result of our own misguided decision-making processes that uh, we end up damaging ourselves, we end up damaging those around us. Uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of those kinds of painful things that, uh, that are very difficult for us to bring into a conscious acceptance of who we are as human beings. So specifically here, when we're talking about treating adolescents, we're recognizing that uh, these adolescents on developmental vacation have obviously not developed a mature coping system that will allow them to deal with the painful affect that is connected to these events in their lives. And uh, you know, as human beings, we have this uh, <laughs> kind of a unique mechanism of, of managing this stuff. So instead of bringing it into our 
immediate consciousness and making it a part of our awareness on our day-to-day -day existence, what we do is we tend to stuff it down into what could be referred to as a psychological basement. And uh, I kind of like that visual where you have to go down the stairs and there's a closet down those stairs. I mean, throw all that stuff down there because uh, you can put it down there and slam the door and then run up the stairs and turn off the light and pretend it to some degree that that material doesn't exist. Um, and we hopefully then can conduct our lives in a manner such that we don't ever really have to encounter whatever that stuff might be, and the painful emotion that is attached to it down there, that we don't ever really have to manage that. But this also puts us on this life of avoidance, because uh, it's that material in our basement and our inability to manage that material in our basement that will dictate the kinds of decisions that we make on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, more so than our public persona. Because we are going to make those decisions that keep us as far away from that material as we possibly can. This tends to, to personify that development of vacation. I'm, I'm, I'm avoiding any kind of an experience. I'm avoiding any kind of an effective experience that would uh, bring me closer to whatever that material might be down there in my basement closet. And so, uh, you know, the most important thing for me then is to um, avoid those aspects of my life I, as opposed to being fully engaged in a complete life. Now, as we're talking about the stuff that might be down there, I think there's a, a unresolved sadness would be one of those things. And, and, and again, each one of these things that we're talking about requires a fairly mature coping system to be able to accept this and bring it into our consciousness. So uh, uh, you know, the sadness, obviously fear is going to be a huge one of these, okay? And uh, shame or guilt, and there would be some authors that would also say, well, we shame, guilt, and it's disgust is, is what that is. All of these are uh, pretty intense kinds of emotions, right? Each one of these, under typical circumstances, would be quite motivational for us to do something, to engage some kind of a process such that um, we're moving beyond this, we're finding a way to exist with it, we're finding a way to alter our behavior so that we don't experience these kinds of things. But if we're living a life of avoidance, we're not doing much to change this. We're not actually engaging these emotions, and they are not having an influence on the decisions that we make. They're not having much of an influence on our behavior as well. Now, one of the things, too, that we might want to talk about here just a little bit is the idea that we're not talking about anger, right? You know, fear, shame. Sadness, but that anger is not necessarily down there in the closet. And uh, for adolescents, it's not typically in the closet because this is what we see from adolescents all the time that uh, their typical presentation is going to be hostility and anger. So it's not really down there in the basement closet, but it has a function relative to what that is down there in the closet. So the first one of these is that if I'm going to be this angry guy, then I am now going to use my anger to make sure that I am insulated from the more painful emotion that's down there in my basement. Okay? You know, and, and instead of actually going to the more genuine emotion, which for most adolescents, we're really looking at fear for them. You know, and, and it's a tough one for them to have to go down there and contact us. So it's a lot easier to become angry. And uh, at least that way I am energized by that. And uh, now that, that focus on my anger keeps me from actually having to contact that core emotion. And the other part about this, the nice thing about anger, 
is that it's a beautiful transport mechanism, right? So instead of now really having to genuinely deal, deal with the idea that at the core of all of this, I am very afraid of something. I'm, I'm extremely afraid more than anything of finding out that I'm not okay, is, is really what that is. And that whatever that emotional material might be at my core is going to be overwhelming to me. So I, I'm going to avoid that. My anger insulates me from it. But then by using my anger and making it so that you have to deal with my anger, now I'm making it so that you have the problem. Okay, this now becomes your problem and not mine. And uh, it, it's a nice way as well for me to be able to sit back and watch you ineffectively deal with whatever the situation might be. And, and I can feel justified in my inability to manage this as well. So as we're talking about, you know, what's down there in the closet, in that basement, in that psychological basement, yeah, you know, anger's not usually there because you usually get to see the anger up there on the outside. Now, let's talk about this um, because uh, it, it, it's pretty tough for our adolescents, especially in an outpatient setting, for them to uh, to get beyond that avoidance piece. In an outpatient setting, adolescents are very, very adept at ensuring that they will have access to all of their dependency. And, and as we're moving into this understanding of, of manipulation, one of those things that they're incredibly adept at doing is using other humans as dependency to keep them insulated from whatever that material might be down there in the basement. Okay? And, and, it, and it's tough. It's tough to get them to, uh, it's, it's tough to find a place uh, for them to consciously go down and open the door and find out what's in there, uh, in their basement, and genuinely be able to accept that and acknowledge that that, that is a part of their lives. So uh, instead of going down there in the basement, I stay in mesh relationships. And uh, one of the best relationships that's going to be more and most important to me is that that I have with my parents. Because I'm using them, uh, I'm using them as objects. Uh, I'm making them be the ones that are experiencing the anxiety or fear that I should be experiencing. And as long as they are doing that, then I don't actually have to. Now, Let's try and understand this in terms of manipulation as well. And I, I think we all know that manipulation can be an incredibly effective tool, that it, that it actually has its intended effect. And it's also something that tends to be a big part of the human experience. We learn how to do this uh, without even really thinking about it. It is a part of our upbringing, no matter where we are. And I do also believe that as human beings, we have come to a position in which we understand that there is a, a, an, a, an acceptable level of manipulation that may actually take place in each relationship. And we become particularly frustrated, however, when it goes over the line so to speak, or when um, the only way that we have of interacting now becomes manipulative, and that's when we begin having problems. Now, really, what this boils down to is, is that we struggle when we, when we begin experiencing unpleasant emotion that belongs to another, another human being. And, and there's, there's kind of a little visual that I like to use when I'm talking with parents or whoever about manipulation. It's this whole idea. It's like, look, if we can, we can think of it in these kinds of terms. Think about you know, someone in your life, if they have decided because they're on a developmental vacation, because they are living a life of avoidance, they have decided that they don't want to deal with any of the unpleasant emotion that they might have 
that truly belongs to them, that is a function of the life that they are living. And certainly, if they're living a life of avoidance, then there is going to be a lot of anxiety and fear, and perhaps even some shame that's going to be attached to that. Okay? But if they have decided, no, I'm not going to be the one that's going to deal with this. Somebody else is going to do this. So you can, you can envision them deciding, well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to take this painful emotion, I'm going to put it in a nice little box, and I'm going to wrap it up with some brightly colored paper, and I'm going to put a nice little bow on that box. And I'm going to march this nicely wrapped box over to your house. Okay? And I'm going to stand out there on that front doorstep. And I'm going to ring that doorbell. And I'm going to ring it, and I'm going to ring it, and I'm going to ring it, and I'm going to ring it. Until you finally show up there at the door. And you open up the door, and there I am standing with my nice little box. And I'm going, here you go. I made this just for you. I got this was just exactly what you need in your life. And, and, and I'm standing there with those big puppy dog eyes and I'm extending that box out to you. Okay? And we run into problems then as human beings when we decide, oh, well, yes, you're going to go ahead and take that box from you. And I'm going to open it up and, oh, gosh, what's in there? Well, here's all of this guilt, anxiety, and fear. Okay, that, that really belongs to you, but I'm going to bring this in. It's like, oh my gosh, here, all of this stuff is, and now I am going to bring this into my life, and I am going to engage my life as though this were my own. I'm going to do the same kinds of things that I'm going to do. I'm going to be knocking myself out trying to correct the situation because I am actually being motivated by this painful emotion that is not impacting you, but it was impacting me. And as I'm knocking myself out trying to fix the situation, you will be over there preparing the next little box for me, the next salvo that you can present to me um, uh, to take care of because you don't want to do that. Now, upon just superficial inspection, you realize, man, this sounds really crazy. Let's, let's look at this. Let's kind of break it down. It's like, OK, really. What are the parts over which I have any control? Well, first of all, I can't control whether or not you have decided that you're not going to manage your own stuff. Okay? I can't control that. I can't control that you have decided that I am going to be your target, that it's going to be my house, it's going to be my front doorstep. I can't control whatever it is that you're doing to ring that bell, okay? to get my attention, to zero in on me. I can't control that. That's still all you. All of that's you. I open up the door, and there you are. I can't control whatever little story you're going to give me. I can't control the puppy dog eyes. I can't control the, you pushing the box. Here's the box. Here's the box. Here's the box. Take the box. Take the box. I can't control that part. The only part that I can control is whether or not I decide to reach out with my own hands and grab that box. And, and that is the piece. That is the magic of manipulation. It's like, wait, why do I grab the box? That's kind of a crazy thing to do if, if we were to look at it in these terms. Why do I take that box? That's the piece that we need to Why do we as human beings take that box? Because that would be the piece that we would want to disrupt. Why do parents take the box when the, when the adolescent is handing it to them? Okay? We want to disrupt that. And if we want the adolescent to finally experience themselves in a situation where their old code of being, their, their mechanisms for ensuring that dependencies are in place are no longer there, we have to address that piece. So um, we decide, you know, we go back to some of those fundamental behavioral principles, like we're always doing the thing that we think is best for us at any given time. Okay, so we have to look at it and decide, okay, now wait a minute, why would I take the box? Okay, why would I ever think that taking the box is going to be the most appropriate thing or the best thing that I could do at that moment? How does this actually work? Okay, and the other part of this is, is that I realize that, I, you know, really, no one else, I, no one can manufacture emotion for me to feel. I, I, it's my own emotion. It has to well within me. 
Okay, it emanates from within me. So if I am feeling something and I am being motivated by that emotion, if that emotion is fueling my behavior, it's coming from within me, right? Now, if we take all of these into consideration, then how do we how do we begin to conceptualize this, right? Part of it is is that if I'm in an enmeshed relationship with you, my primary concern is going to be ensuring that you do whatever it is that I need you to do so that I can be okay, right? I, I'm, I'm not going to do what I need to do to be okay. It's, it's me being able to get you to do that. So that also means that if I'm going to be in that enmeshed relationship with you, there's a part of you that I know better than you do. And, and, and truly, we, we like to think that we're pretty sophisticated on all of this, but we're really not. Okay? None of us are really all that great at doing this. Now, we, we like to think that we're really good at being able to keep all of our dragons down there in the basement. But truly, we also have to do is hang around with you for just a little while and see how you manage things, and particularly watch what it is that you avoid, and uh, um, watch uh, particularly if there's a lot of hostility, that, that is a big part of who you are. And the kind of thing I'm going to know, man, there's a lot of dragons down there. So to some degree, I can hang around with you, I can be engaged in this relationship with you, and my job to figure out, wow, what are those dragons? I'm going to know more about those than you are. And you're not going to want to take a look at those. So what happens then, this is the piece that makes it take the box. And uh, let me maybe just illustrate this again. Okay? And I, I, I guess the, um, the, the best way to talk about this is uh, there's like a little example that I like to use that uh, it's kind of a part of my experience with my daughter. With, with uh, actually, it's it's uh, um, youngest daughter, my, my second youngest child, but it's the youngest daughter that I have. And uh, you know, a, a little bit of an experience. I can see her when she was about four, and when our life together at that time uh, was incredibly fragmented. And uh, I. I, I see us standing together in the neighborhood market at about 4.30 or about 5 o'clock in the evening. And we're standing in the checkout line waiting to purchase whatever, uh, whatever it is that we came to get so we can take it home and uh, get it prepared for the meal. Now, oh, a couple of things. If it's me that's standing there in that line with my four-year-old daughter at that Time, it will have meant that there was something that already went wrong. Okay, that there was something in the schedule that day that went wrong, such that I had to perhaps cancel my my uh, last appointment of the day to uh, go pick up my daughter from um, like daycare or from swimming practice or from gymnastics, whatever it was that she was doing. And uh, then I had to be the one with her in the store getting all of that stuff. So it meant that, that either my older daughters or my wife was uh, uh, incapacitated in some regard. And so I was already there, and I was already sweating the fact, well, I had to cancel my last appointment, and I'm either on the phone with the office manager or with the individual that I had canceled and was trying to reschedule and was trying to uh, keep everything copacetic. And I'm already irritated to be there. So the other part then, too, was standing there with my daughter, and uh, she's eyeballing that marvelous world of candy that they have at every checkout stand in the grocery store in the nation. And she decides at that moment that there really is nothing more important in her world than to be able to obtain a bag of peanut m ms that she's now selected. And so she starts now. Yeah, yeah, really, as a four-year-old, how is she going to do this? Is she going to uh, move me into uh, some kind of a cognitive debate? You know, something, oh, pardon me, Father. Can I convince you to 
So Q4 being this marvelous bag of uh, peanut M&Ms. No, no, she's not going to do that. And on top of that, if I am already preoccupied with my own stuff, trying to manage a situation that I'm already a little irritated about, uh, I'm, I'm likely going to be going off to some degree saying, no, 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 put it back, put it back. And so then where does that go? Well, before I know it, you now I have my four-year-old daughter doing the screaming, flailing tuna in the middle of the market floor. Now, how does this actually work? Well, for me, you know, what happens? I, I see my daughter doing the screaming, flailing tuna, and my first thought is, uh, gee, I hope none of my clients are here to see this because if they're going to see, they're going to look around and they're going to say, whew, wow, geez, is that Sanderson over there? He must not be much of a psychologist. If he can't even name his daughter here in the store, um, I, I may have to rethink my position in seeing him professionally. And, uh, you know, the second pass around, I'm looking and seeing all the other parents there with all their marvelously well-behaved children who are sitting quietly in the cars and they're all looking over at me. And I know that they're all thinking, gee, what's wrong with that guy? He must just be you know, one of those drive-by dads that doesn't really spend any time with his daughter, has no idea how to handle them, and, uh, and now um, she's causing this incredible commotion, and it's uh, causing all kinds of disruption for all of us. We're just trying to somehow get through this experience and get checked out as well. And at the same time, I'm also thinking about the individual that I'm going to have to put on hold on the phone. And you know, I've already um, um, had to cancel the appointment and you know, those kinds of things. And so you know, all of this stuff is going on. So I reach over what happened. I grab that bag of P&M and I put it up there on the conveyor belt to be purchased. So looking at this and we're thinking, okay, you know, what happened? How did this actually happen? Well, I, I can imagine uh, in processing this that at the moment that I pick up that bag of M&Ms and put it on the conveyor belt, then there's going to be like a television news crew that comes crashing through the side door. And everything goes into the freeze frame. Everything stops at that moment. And I come in with the camera guy and the sound guy and the interviewer, and I stick that microphone in my daughter's face, and they say, wow, that was absolutely amazing. Your father had no intention of buying peanut M and M's for you, and in, um, the, in a matter of three seconds, here he is buying those peanut M and M's. How did you manage to do that? Now, again, you know, my daughter at this point would be four, but if she could verbalize all of this, she would be saying something along the lines of, "Well, Bob, um, uh, you know, have, after having hung around with my father for four years, I know that my father, in spite of all the bluster, tends to be a pretty insecure guy." And that I know that at any point in time, that the thing that is most concerning to my father is not appearing like a moron. Okay? So all I have to do is create a situation in which my father now is feeling a bit flustered and looking around, and all of a sudden, all of those, oh, oh, you're a moron dragon that my father had down in his psychological basement start threatening to burst out of that closet and start clamoring up the stairs. And as soon as one of those dragons rears its ugly head, that becomes the most immediate and salient concern that my father has. So my father now has the primary job of putting the dragons back in the basement. And as such, my pitiful little task of getting peanut m and pales pales by comparison. Right? So my dad is always going to do whatever he has to do to put the dragons in the basement. Right? And if that means like, okay, I get the m and the dragons go back in the basement, cool. You know, I can resume my conversation on the phone. Everybody quits looking at me. But actually, what happened at that point? Right? If if that is actually the way that it's going to go, what just happened? Well, I abandoned my role as a parent. Okay, you know, it's like, uh, gee, I, I am no longer serving the purpose that I have as a parent to my child. You know? And that purpose would be to facilitate the development of an independently responsible human being. I'm not doing that anymore. Okay, I've abandoned that role. 
And I allowed my child to continue to experience herself as the center of the universe. She is the dragon commander, right? And she has, has that capacity to influence everything around her, right? She, she hasn't really made that differentiation piece, that separation piece, that I'm the center of the universe. Everyone else is, is still there to ensure that I'm okay. And that, um, again, she is also learning that she's going to have influ influence in the world, especially by, uh, by calling forth my individual brain. Right? So, you know, this is that piece of manipulation that we're talking about. It's if our children have the capacity to call forth our dragons, then we will be manipulated every time. Every time, because the choice that we have when we reach out and take the box is that choice between, well, give me the box, because I don't want to deal with my own dragons. I don't want to actually have to deal with that painful material that I have down there in my basement that I still consider to be overwhelming to me, that I still have not developed the coping mechanisms to be able to manage that. So as long as I'm still in that situation, as long as I personally am at that place where those dragons are the most fearful thing to me, I'll take the box every time. As crazy as that might be, I'll take the box every time. So in all of this, then, and, you know, this, is, this is helpful because it's a parallel process for both adolescents and parents. Right? But what is the essence of individual therapy? Well, I, I, I'm going down in the basement. That's the essence of individual therapy. Whatever it is that I have to do to get down there in that basement and open that door and see what really is in there and be in a position where I can accept whatever that is that might be in there. You know, a part of that for us as therapists as well is to assist that descent into the basement, right? And, and get to that place where our clients, whether they're adults or adults, can we see what it really is? It may well be that what I put in that basement as a terrifying, fire-eating dragon as a very little child now, over the years, has come to be seen as really nothing more than just a gecko. It may not have been as, uh, as frightening to me now as it was way back then. But with parents as well, it's also helping them recognize that uh, their, their children are continuing to use them as objects and use them as dependencies. And the way that they do that is they play upon the fears that they may have as they're really not good enough parents, that they don't love their children enough, or that um, their children is, is, is unable to be able to manage the material that they have in their own lives, the reality of their own lives, all right? So, the next piece, uh-oh, it looks like um, must have done something to let's see if I can get this back. There it is. Ah, oh, there it is. Okay. So, you know, really what we're looking at as far as, as, as in therapy and part of the experiential component of all of this is number one, you gotta find a safe place for both for both parents and adolescents to be able to go in and be getting examined the basement. You know, and, and a lot of times this can only happen if we get to that place where we're making that physical separation. Like, look, I've got to disrupt the dynamic. We've got to get you guys into a different place and be able to control the nature of the interaction that you have here for a little while. So that um, as and you as the adolescent you are no longer just doing whatever you got to do to call forth your parents' dragon. And also, letting the parents settle a bit so that they are not overwhelmed by their dragons and that they have the ability to be able to examine why are their dragons so obvious and what is it about their dragons that is, is so incredibly intense to them and overwhelming and finding a way for them to gain control of their own basement. Okay? And the other part about this is, is that 
what are we really trying to do with auto license? Well, we need them to understand that they can have a sense of resiliency in their lives. Okay? That, that instead of dependency, instead of this idea that I'm always going to need someone else, that, that, that my life is too hard for me to be able to manage, and that I will always need someone else, or that I will need something else as, as a means of being able to cope with the world. It's that idea that, gee, there really is no aspect of my, my life that's beyond my capacity to manage. Now, um, you know, a part of this too is, is that it's recognizing that there are there are children that have gone through some incredibly horrendous experiences. No, no question about that. And and uh, that it will likely take some time to get there. But again, we are not doing them any service. If we continue in our efforts, as far as therapy is concerned, is to keep them dependent upon something else to help them manage this. You know, it's, it's that idea that I can't even I can't even be dependent upon my therapist. Ultimately, I'm working with my therapist to get beyond this, so that even though there have been a multitude of things that absolutely suck in my life, that ultimately I can see myself as somebody that can be able to, to manage that, that there's really not anything of my own life that is beyond my capacity to manage. Now, in and, and doing so, then I don't have any dragons in my basement that I don't know about. Now, you know, a, a, a part of this, too, is, is realizing that as I go down and examine those dragons, it means that now as a human, I have to experience that affective material that's attached to those traits. And that will still be painful. And that it was painful in the first place, that's why we put it down there. And it's likely still going to be painful. And one of those tasks that we have as therapists is assisting our adolescents and even the adults that we see is realizing, look, um, you've got to experience that pain because that's what made them so. You know, the pain that you are experiencing is not necessarily telling you that there's something wrong with you. It's reinforcing the notion that you truly are a human being, and that is what human beings feel when they have these kinds of experiences. So there can be some incredibly intense, painful emotion, and find out that we can experience the pain, we can feel the pain. Um, and, and it can impact us deeply, but we don't necessarily need to be punished by that pain. That it doesn't necessarily have to continue to remind us that there's something wrong with us. It, it, it needs to exist in the form of reminding us that, that we are indeed human beings, that this is the other kind of thing. That, that humans need to experience. So if I can come to a resolution to some degree in all of this, and that I acknowledge that, yeah, I have those dragons in my basement, that, yeah, I mean, there, are, there are those insecurities that are there, and that um, I have been greatly impacted by those insecurities. I have been greatly impacted by those fears in the past. And I know of their existence, and I know that uh, they, they are somewhat painful to me, and they, they may be somewhat embarrassing to me, but I know that they are there. And if I acknowledge them, then it makes it so that you are unable to use them as a means of manipulating. You can't punish me with them because I'm not feeling punished by them. Yeah, I will feel some pain, but I'm, I'm not going to punish myself with the dragons that I have in my own basement, and so they're not available for you to punish me either. So you may be standing outside my door on my step there, um, handing me that brightly colored box of your painful emotional material that you don't want to deal with, and I know what it is. It's like I, I, 
they can be able to say, ooh, I can see this is a tough situation for you, but guess what? You need to be able to deal with that. And I can be okay in, in knowing that I'm not damaging you as a result of that. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not allowing myself to be damaged by that. And the other part about this, too, as we're going through this and we are assisting our, our parents to help the children gain that sense of resiliency, is that we're also um, impeding the process for them in which they are communicating to their children that somehow or another they don't have the capacity to be able to handle the painful material in their lives. Right? And, and every time that a child successfully manipulates a parent, it continues to reinforce for them the idea that I really shouldn't have to do this, I don't really have the capacity to do this, someone else has to do this for me. But part of the message has to be, gee, my child, this is going to be a painful thing for you to do, this is not going to be easy. You're probably going to screw up in the process of doing this. You don't know how to do this. You, you likely will fail in this process. But that's part of the learning process as well. You, you are able to do this. Is it going to be hard? Yeah, it will be hard. And especially if we're talking about trying to come to grips with some horrendous um, early childhood difficulties, with some very negligent um, nurturing, caretaking kinds of things. So all of those things that happen to is, is that going to be difficult to deal with? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely it will be. But the message needs to come, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have to do this for you. I'm going to help you with this. I'm going to stay out with you for as long as we need to. But ultimately, you're not going to need me or anybody else to be able to manage this. You're going to be able to be the guy that can do it. So, that's, that's the piece for manipulation. Anything that we can do to assist parents in, in understanding this process is absolutely going to be an incredibly effective and impactful thing. Now, part of this, too, is that we are assisting adolescents in recognizing that if they are coming to this position in their lives, where there really is such a thing as self-efficacy, okay? Then they have this notion of, like, I know it can be okay, and the reason why I know it can be okay is because I've seen myself do it. And as long as our adolescents are on that developmental vacation, this, this process is not going to happen because I'm avoiding those kinds of things that I need to engage that helped me have that experience where I've seen myself do this. So it's as, as we move along and then as we're working as well as helping parents to understand, well, how am I using my relationship with my child to uh, determine whether or not they're moving beyond that developmental vacation. We have to keep this in mind, okay? Where are we seeing our, ch our children engaged in the struggle of mastery? And, and as we talk about that mastery, it has a, a, a lot to do with structure, okay? So let's take a look at this, right? For the adolescents to move beyond the developmental vacation, a couple of things has to happen, right? The first one is, is that um, the old patterns are no longer effective. I'm, I'm standing on the doorstep and I'm ringing the doorbell and you might even come to the door and say, ah, hey, no thanks, no thanks. I think, uh, I think you probably need to keep that one, okay? Yeah, it's going to be hard for you to have to keep that. It's going to be hard for you to not take that, but no thanks, okay? That uh, whatever it is that they have been doing to call forth dragons and others, or whatever they have been doing to try and ensure that the other dependencies that they have in their lives are, are no longer insulating them from their real lives. And uh, just to refer back to some of our earlier discussions, this would mean, well, that means I can't, I can't engage um, uh, my wife to be able to dictate the delivery of the traditional kind of dependencies that insulate me from my emotions.
reactions, the chemical dependencies, those kinds of things, or the process dependencies, or those kinds of things that that take place in cyberspace as well, right? So if, if we're helping them move to a place of mastery, the old patterns can't be affected, they can't have access. They can no longer call for any of their dependencies, right? Okay, and I've got to see myself as being the guy that can do this. And uh, for many adolescents in treatment, this is something that's not been a part of their lives. They've not had to see themselves as that person that has the capacity to do what needs to be done. Um, they see themselves as being extremely capable in calling forth the dependency, but they don't necessarily see themselves as being competent in their capacity to, to master the structure that they encounter in their lives. So we're trying to ultimately move those children out of that enmeshed relationship, the new blob that we talked about. Okay? That uh, ideally we should be making some significant cracks in that relationship about the time that our child turns about six years of age. You know, we should be starting to open up that door and, and pushing them out there in that process of individuation and separation. It starts about six, it's concurrent with our kids moving on to school and having to engage in other adult relationships besides with just us as parents and having to deal with the kind of social hierarchy that they're going to find there with all of their other friends and that kind of thing and having to deal with the task of school and learning and just managing and disciplining myself. That's kind of where it all starts. And they start beginning to, to determine that um, they don't need to be completely reliant upon the adults in their lives, especially the parents, to give them a sense of okayness. That it can actually be through their own industry. They, they begin finding out that there are those things that they can do to be a bit more okay. Right? So, now, we want that to have happened, started to happen at about six. If it didn't, then they're going to persist in that enmeshed relationship. And as, as the farther it goes, the harder it is to move beyond that as well. Okay? Now, the nice thing about this, too, is, is that we can help the parents understand that you know, if we're putting the child in a more responsible position, then the parent can accurately or more accurately assess that strength of the child's commitment to be the child in the relationship. So, you know, if we look at this, let's see if we can bring, you know, let's look at this, looking at it with, well, here is me and my child, right? And if my child is moving out of that enmeshed relationship where their only concern is ensuring that they're using me to be okay. Well, I can step back and I can take a look at it and decide, well, okay, you know, really what then is the purpose here? You know, and I'm, I'm looking at it and I mentioned this just briefly in passing earlier in our discussion today. As a parent, what is my ultimate purpose? Well, you know, my ultimate purpose is to facilitate the development of an independent and responsible human being. So, for, from my perspective, I can look at this and decide, well, gee, am I really committed to doing this? Can I look at the history that I have with my child and does it bear witness that, yeah, I, you know, I've actually done those things that I need to do to facilitate the development of an independent and responsible human being? The part that I don't know is, is that for you, my child, how important is this to you? What kind of a commitment are you making to becoming that independently responsible human being. And significantly, I, I would have to look at this initially and decide, well, how committed are you to allowing you to be the parent in this relationship? Because as, we, as we've talked about in earlier discussions, that would be the piece that would help me understand that, yes, you actually have resolved those developmental tasks of childhood that you're, you're seeing me as that individual who truly is the purveyor of benevolent structure and who has that influence in your life. 
and uh, you know, can help again to provide continuing structure for you. So just to establish, to, uh, to, to wrap this up, you know, there's, there's a couple of things here as we're talking about um, that uh, we, we kind of want to skip through this piece. I do want to get to this part where we talk about the ultimate purpose of a parent, okay? And here it is once again, to facilitate the development of that independently responsible human being. Now, there, there are two things that parents do to accomplish this purpose. And this is you know, all of the kinds of tasks and interventions and check sheets and lists and everything that we do for parents to help them, they all fall, all fall under the rubric of these two tasks, okay? The first thing is, is that number one, you know, parents absolutely must model what it looks like to be an independently responsible adult. You know, our children are looking at us and they're trying to determine, especially, you know, gee, when, they, when they're getting to that place where they're somewhat unresolved in their own life and conflicted in their own lives as really little kids, and they're thinking, well, gee, you know, do I want to continue to be the center of the universe or am I going to acknowledge that it's okay for me to be a little kid? And I can do that if I can kind of look up and see these parents in my life who have all the, the influence that I think that I should have access to. You know, and I need to see them being able to walk on this planet as the influential people that they are instead of being individuals as well who succumb to their own dependencies, all right? So the other part is, uh, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm watching my parents engaged in the struggle. Are they going to do this perfectly? No. But I need to see them engaged, okay? If they are in avoidance mode, I'm not going to see them as independently responsible adults, okay? The second thing is, is that parents absolutely must be those individuals who are implementing the structure within the realm of their own kingdom, okay? And this is that piece where we help them. This is where the consistency piece, and, and, and as adolescents and children, you know, find out any time they implement that structure, a child's development of task is to figure out how can I have influence relative to this structure? And if I find that my influence comes from manipulation, that's what I'm gonna do. If my influence comes from being able to learn how to master the structure, that's what I'm going to do. So I guess we better wind it up for 